<laughs> well, I bet all of you here can remember six on six. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we played half court. You know, at one time there were three courts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were two forwards, and then you had a middle section of the court, and there was what they called the center, and then you had your two guards at the other end, and you had a limited number of dribbles, two dribbles. And you could not touch the other player. That wouldn't oh, work today at all. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it has evolved over time. Uh, I think uh, early 90s is when they first started uh, advocating the fight. Well, they had, had advocated it quite some time. But when they first allowed the schools to vote whether they wanted five on five or six on six, and a lot of them still play, you know, the, the six on six. But then in 1995, everybody had to go to the five on five. And uh, Oklahoma was the last state in the union to actually go to five on five. It had, for a while, it had been Oklahoma and Iowa. And Iowa finally went, and then Oklahoma was the last state. So that's kind of the history of why, why we are where we are today. But... Um, uh, Lindsay, I doubt as far back I can go was back in the early 50s. Uh, Martin Luper, um, Martin, Martin Loper. Loper. Martin Charles Loper. Red Loper. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Martin Loper was the basketball coach, and in 1954, they won a state championship. And a lot of you know Mary Beckham mm -hmm. and Betty Robbins, and both of them played on the first state championship team that we, that we had in, in Lindsay. Uh, he left the next year, and the boys' basketball coach, who was Jim Killingsworth at the time, took over the girls. He wasn't much of an advocate for, for girls playing basketball, so he didn't put a lot of effort into it. But I will say this, he's the one that taught me how to shoot a jump shot. Mm -hmm. And uh, he told us when he left, when he left in, in, at the end of the year, 1959, the end of the school year, he told us, he said, this is probably the best thing that's ever happened to you girls. And it was. <laughs> And, of course, as I said earlier, Coach Haley came in in 1959. The year before, in 58-59 uh, uh, season, when Killingsworth was here, we'd won five games. The next year, when first year Coach Haley was here, we, went, we won 13 games. The next year, we won 25 games and were state runner-up. And the next year, we were state champions. So in three years, he turned a program around that was pretty much yeah. fix and go out the door <laughs> if it hadn't been for him. Uh, and like I said, he came here in 1959. Uh, he had two state championships in the time that he was here. And I know at least two state runner-ups. He may have had three. I don't remember for sure about that, but I know he had, I know he had two because we were state runner-up in, in 1961 and in 1963, they were also state runner-up. Um, he went to the state tournament 14 times while he was a coach here and then 28 years. So 50% of his teams went to the state tournament. Uh, so that, that's a pretty impressive record in itself. Uh, I don't remember what year it was, but he was also voted National Girls Basketball Coach of the Year one year. So he has quite an impressive record. When he first came here, what we just experienced as the uh, Haightley Classic was called the All-Girl Tournament. And the only, of course, all, obviously what the name implies, all it had were girls yeah. teams in it. Uh, it finally evolved to the point that we had actually two brackets. We had two teams, two different sets of brackets, and girls from Eastern Oklahoma and Western Oklahoma would come. We had quite a unique situation in that those that lived, you know, two and a half, three hours away from here, uh, and we didn't have but one little hotel, one didn't have near the rooms that they have out there now. Uh, the players that came in would stay with uh, families here in Lindsay, and they would spend Thursday and Friday and Saturday at those families' homes. And, uh, uh, of course, we got quite well acquainted with the kids, in fact, this one right here is named after one of the girls that stayed with us. Her name was Jackie Edge from Kingfisher. She stayed with us her sophomore, junior, and senior year. She made All-State, and the All-State games at that time were also held in Lindsay. 
and uh, the kids stayed the families again, and she stayed with us when she made all state, and we just, she kind of just became a part of the family, so when this one was born, we decided we wanted to name this one Jackie. <laughs> so she must have been very infectious. <laughs> <laughs> she was. She was. She was. She was quite. She was quite amusing. I can remember well, at the time we only had one one bathroom, and I think Cody was in the bathroom, and she came down the hall and she pounded on the door. She said, "I need to get in there. Get out of there." <laughs> so you know, she like I said, she just made herself at home, and we we certainly enjoyed her. Uh, Early in the early '60s, again, I don't, I can't tell you exactly what year it was. Uh, Coach Hagley started the Lindsay All Girl All Star Basketball Camp, and he ran that till probably, mm, I guess maybe when he quit. The, I think they have stopped it before. Jackie was were they still having it when you were when you graduated? Yeah. Yes, I think they probably still had it till the early '90s, and that they finally stopped it, uh, but that. They would have five to six weeks of basketball camp, and there would be 250, 300 girls every week. So you can imagine the influx of girls that would come in. Uh, it was the first bas girls basketball camp held in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, it, in fact, one of the first ones even held nationally. There were a few, but not very many. But he also had basketball camps in Alaska. And was it Arizona or New Mexico? Do you remember which one? New Mexico. New Mexico. I don't remember. Yeah. He had them in three or four different states. Yeah, and so, you know, and, and like we were talking about earlier, you know, you never go <coughs> to any place if somebody had on a red and white t-shirt, they said, oh, my kids have been to that camp, <laughs> you know. Uh, or if we had on one, or if they had on one, we'd say, you, you've been to that camp. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was quite, quite well known, quite well thought of. Also during that time, he and I think it was about five other coaches uh, got together and formed the uh, girls, Oklahoma Girls Basketball Association, and from that came became we got the first all state uh, girls all state teams. And again, they were held in Lindsay. And the girls, when they came in that week's time, they stayed with families here in in, in the community. And uh, I'm sure Daryl's he was at the ball game some this weekend. Uh, Clayton said he was there. Uh, I don't know whether no, you I mean, went or not, I'm but uh, you know now when you go to any of the basketball games, there's there's not a lot of people. I mean, there's friends and families yeah. that are there, but when we had that all-girl tournament and when we had those all-state games, that Haightley Arena was packed. Mm -hmm. In fact, they were standing at the ends of the courts to watch the games. So. Of course, I'm a proponent of six on six. I think they run girls basketball when they went to five on five. That's just my personal opinion. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he, of course, he retired in 1987. Uh, Rick Johnston was the, was the next basketball coach that came in, and he took them to the state tournament the next year. Uh, I don't remember where they got to beat the first or the second game, but they did go to the state tournament the next year. He was only here about three years, and then he left. And then Mike Zerling came in. A lot of you may be familiar with Mike. Uh, he was here, mm, I would say, nine, ten years that he coached here. And of course, most of his was five, was five on five because they had converted to that. Uh, when Mike left, uh, Glenn Shoemake came in and was girls basketball coach for uh, about three years. And then he left. And then uh, Tanya... Loman, uh, another Lindsay product. Glenn and, and Tanya both were Lindsay products, came in and coached, and she coached six or seven years. And then John Jakes came in and coached, and he coached about that long also. And then, of course, we have our present coach, uh, Brian Tater. Um, I, I don't have their records. I, I didn't, didn't look those up. Uh, and, of course, I'm more familiar with the early beginnings. but. Uh, uh, I, we have a really rich tradition of girls basketball here in, in, in Lindsay, and a lot of it can be attributed to Coach Haightley, but I think a lot of his success can also be attributed to Hody because he took the young girls, worked with them, taught them fundamentals. Even after he quit coaching the actual basketball teams, he had little dribblers and he had the little ones over in the, the uh, 10, 10 building over at the grade school 
and, and did the same thing with them, taught them fundamentals. And I think that's a lot of what we're missing nowadays is that they don't get taught those fundamentals early. We just throw the ball out there and say, let's go fly. You gotta do this and this. And they don't know how to dribble or how to pass the ball to begin with. But uh, we do have a rich tradition. That's, that's about all I got. Uh, another thing I would like to add on the girls basketball is when we had the camp, I was up there a couple of three summers helping and um, I was fortunate to coach with Reba McIntyre, yeah. the great singer. And uh, uh, what was the girl, Sher Sherry, the coach at OU, she, Sherry was in the, she, Sherry was in, she was in the picture with us too and I still got those pictures. And, and I, they're kind of special to me. And Diane, did we have the Texas Oklahoma All Star yes. Game here at we, Lindsay? We too? used to have a Texas Oklahoma All Star yeah. Game, and it it was played. Well, I think it was alternated. One year it was played at Texas, and maybe yeah. one year yeah, we also had come that. to Oklahoma. We also had it here. But like I said, the gyms were packed. There were yeah. lots of people, and it wasn't just family. It was people from. And, and back in those days. We had the slide out bleachers. Yeah. And since then, they've done away with that in the Haley gym, the middle gym, as I call it. It's just upstairs now. But we had had those bleachers out here. And let me tell you a story while we're still on girls' basketball. <laughs> I was winning for a lot of years. I know it's ups and it's, I know it's downs. And he was, he was, he would get after you, he would get loud. But one time, somebody didn't do it job like you want and you remember those bleachers you had a hand holding you pull them out and you push them in it's about like that and he had some of those quarter of the square toe shoes and he got mad and he kicked and he hit that right in there in that one corner of that shoe kind of creased in a little bit and it was the half time we walked in he was limping i said what how come you limping he said holy my shoe gave way and he couldn't i had to get a broomstick and punch at that gal back out so he could wear his shoe <laughs> that was so funny but i've got a lot of stories to tell him but i'll go into football but he's talking about coach sloper and i looked at this picture over here a while ago about coach sloper on the state championship team in 1954. i was sweeping the floors at lindsey when that was taking place in the grade school that they'd have people up there you know sweeping the little we call it the cracker jack box the, the coats that the the gym that that i played in my senior year and it was crowded too because it wasn't very big and they had those concession stand and empty ways people would get up on top of those and set to what the ball game and you had about that much room from the sideline to the gym it was crowded believe me but boy did we ever play ball there uh, I'll go into football now. You know, 69 years of um, football that I went back and up to this date, which I got a coach that's going to be here next year in 23, and I'll get to that in a little bit. But we had 17 coaches in 29 years. And like I said a while ago, Coach Tunnel coached longer than anybody. He had 14 years here. I don't know about some of these other coaches, but I had a six year tenure myself. And uh, uh, they, after Coach Tunnel retired, they hit me up three times to take the job and I didn't want it because I knew you, you're not supposed to follow a good successful coach, especially when some of the material has gone down. But they ended up t t uh, talking to me and I had two or three pretty good seasons, but boy, it, it was kind of down. It was down, believe me. And, I, I was really involved in girls basketball and, and I was really successful in, in girls basketball with my fourth, fifth and sixth grade little dribblers and seventh, eighth and ninth grade girls that are coached and helped eight them in high school. And I enjoyed that part. But uh, uh, 1954, Cleo Beavers was a football coach here at that time. Then after he left out, Tom Turby was here in 1955. And that's when my brother was a senior. We won a state championship against Pitcher at Stillwater. We beat them right at the end of the game. They gave the ball to my brother, and he kind of just ran the time out, and we won, won that football game. And uh, it was back then, you didn't have the playoffs where you, you had to lose two games, you know, if you want to come in four in your district. Right then, you had a district, regional, and a state. You had three ball games that you had to win to, to get in the state tournament. And uh, 
we we did that, and I had a brother that was a junior. Gene Hunk S made all state in basketball, and I was a freshman. And there's four of us freshmen played on the high school team. Milhauser was a starter as a linebacker. He was a good football player. He couldn't see a lick. He had those big glances. He couldn't run a lick. I could outrun him backwards on a hundred yard dash, but he had a sense for the football. And Tom Turvey knew that. He was a great football player. In fact, he was with me when we made all state in senior year. He made high school all American. And he was a good football player, and we still communicate. He lives in Richardson, Texas now. But Tom Turvey was here in 56 and 57. Then uh, Vern Robertson come in and coached my senior year. We had some great players. We won every football game we could just about imagine in junior high. Then in, in high school, we were undefeated, and we won Grove 36 to nothing at uh, OU Stadium my senior year. When the game was over, there was snow on the ground about that deep. And we had a great season. But let me go back to 55. I want to tell a story about the, between me and my brother Wayne. There was always a, a question. Who was the better of the team? 1955 or 1958? And I said, boy, 58, Wayne, we had a lot better players. We had more good individuals, special people. Oh, no, we could beat y'all. And, well, we were over at Bobby Dean Hutto and Carolyn Hutto's place one day, and Bob Marston was sitting there with me. And I said, Bob, don't you think we could beat that 55 team? He said, boy, I don't know. And I said, yeah, we could beat them, Bob. And I said, a lot of those people have died, and some of us have died off, you know, or some of our players have died off. And I said, I think we ought to schedule them and play them as old as we are. And old Bob said, you know, I don't think I can make but one play. And I said, well, what we'll do, we'll put a corpse in front of you. <laughs> but anyway, we always had fun with that. But uh, uh, we made, my senior year, we made 540 offensive points. That's a bunch of points. That's a bunch of points in football. And the defense, which our, our first team didn't play a lot, there was just 120 points scored against our defense. So that, that might be a record within itself. Then after that, Lawton Carey took the job in 1959, and uh, we lost uh, two football games there, uh, one against uh, Ardmore Douglas and one against Moore. Back then, Moore was our, our class. We played them. In fact, we played them the second round of playoff my senior year, one of the coldest football games I ever played in. Well, Bill Froman come in, and uh, he had a terrible season, probably in 60 or 61. They won the farm, but they didn't. They didn't farm. We'll come back in 62 and 63, he won back-to-back -back state championships. <laughs> then after that, he moved on down to Texas, to Wichita Falls, of course, of Canada, and coached down there. And he's still living. He's not in good shape, but he's from Miami, Oklahoma, and he played football at Tulsa University. He's, he's a good man. Then Dave Clark come in and uh, and played and coached, not played, but he coached for a few years and uh, he he moved on. I think Fox was on the school board at that time when they hired him. And I talked to Fox. I said, "Why did y'all hire him?" He said, "Well, he had a good looking wife." <laughs> I said, "What credentials?" <laughs> well, anyway, he moved on. Then after that is uh, Coach Tom come in. And uh, he, he took over for 14 years. And let me tell you some of the coaches that we had during that time was Coach Foster, which is a good line coach, good defensive coach. Coach Hayden even helped us. He'd done a lot of the scouting. Uh, coach Hayden was there. He'd done some of the scouting and, and helped. Plus myself, Ralph Riddle, and Joe Holiday, which Hayden coached the girls' basketball and Holiday coached the boys' basketball. But... You know, the most fun I ever had in my life probably in the coaching was with that era that I was there 12 years out of the 14 with Coach Tom. And I always come up with the saying, if you love your job and the people you work with, you'll never have to work a day in your life. And that's the way it was. I always enjoyed going up to the where the right place is now where they had that little biscuit place there. And I would get in there with Bill Burford and Tex Edzards and, and – uh, uh, Doug Stevens and I'd eat breakfast and go up 
And Tom was always there reading the paper, and we would sit and visit before we went into our classroom and stuff like that. But that was one of the most enjoyable time I ever had. Prior to that, I coached over at Maysville with Tommy Holt for two years, and I enjoyed Tommy Holt. I enjoyed Tommy Holt. But anyway, uh, that was that was a good time in Lindsay football right there. We never won a state championship. We should have won two or three more state championships, but there's always something happened that we missed a field goal, an extra point, or we had two good 1,700 yards that year. Arms broke on halfbacks or a quarterback got hurt. Uh, Jimmy Beckham, uh, uh, Rick Dorman, uh, Kenny Fleming, when he played for Froman, he got his arm broke or leg broke when they played at Ada in a state championship game. So there's probably three or four championships. If you didn't have those injuries, you probably could have won more state championship. Well, after that, uh, we went into an era of uh, coaching. Like I said, I had six years. Now, these coach, other coaches, I don't know what year, how many years they stayed here. I never did do that much research, but uh, Jack Yock, I know, was here from 89 to 94. Then Eddie Paul came in and coached. And then Tommy Holt. I heard Tommy Holt is my assistant coach because the story with Tommy Holt, I want to tell this story. I coached with him two years at Maysville, then I moved over here. Then when I got the head coach, I needed the assistant coach, and I, I knew Tommy was a good coach. They were playing a basketball, a peewee basketball game, and it was ahead of flood. We were having a Lindsay All-Star game or something oh, at Lindsay, uh -huh. and the train was going through Maysville, and the train hit that little Dotson pickup and rolled it with Joe Nelson and Candy. Oh, it killed the little girl. Joe Nelson was all right. Well, we got the word back over here, and me and Willis Mackey went to Norman, saying uh, it was a terrible situation. Mm -hmm. But Tommy Holt, he went, he went on the deep end for two or three years, and he was my buddy. And we were at a track meet over at Maysville one time, and I said, Tommy, you're going to start coaching again. No, I'm not. And I said, yes, you are. You're going to start coaching. And I'm going to hire you as my assistant coach, and you're going to come to Lindsay, and you're going to, you're going to start getting on track again. You're going to start coaching. I talked him into it. So he came over and started coaching with me. Then after six years, I decided I, I need to do something else. I need to do something else and give this up and let somebody else take it. And that's when these other coaches started taking it. Then Coach Hope come back. He started coaching. So I started helping him in high school. And we got beat in the, uh, we beat Millwood, we beat Hennessy, we got beat, but we woke up, uh, second game, I guess, or something like that. I can't remember. Anyway, we got beat. Then after Tommy Holt, uh, Don Sneeberger come in for a while. Then Mike Robertson come in. Tommy Ferguson come in as assistant coach. Then John Edmund coached for a while. Then, uh, uh, Sam Emery, top of John Edmund coach, then Sam Emery come in, and there were three good young coaches, and they're in, in the uh, administration now, is either athletic director or a principal, and another one's in a principal, but they're good young coaches that will carry on the tradition here at Lindsay. But let me tell you, the best time, and I was blessed, to coach with the best two coaches in Oklahoma at that time with Joe Tone and Charles Haley. They taught me a lot, not only in, in football, but in life, they, they taught me a lot. And I really appreciate those two guys. And when up at the, uh, it's a funny thing, when I was yeah, inducted into the Hall of Fame up at Tulsa, I had a long speech ready to make up, but there was about, what, how many, 10? I ate, ended up in the Hall of Fame, and some of them got up there and gave speeches too long, so they cut their speeches out, they wouldn't let them talk. So I had to chew mine up and eat it. <laughs> but I wanted to uh, comment on that, that Charles Hatley and Joe Tunnel, I was blessed to coach with them. But that's all I have right now, but it, we still got a good football program going. Uh, we've had some good administrators. You couldn't hardly beat Mr. Robertson, Mr. Carey, though. They would, they would stand behind you no matter what. And uh, uh, 
you can see the facilities we got right now. We got a good complex up there with a new gym and the football field. And I didn't like the football field when I first seen it because it was the Burford field. That's where I played, that's where I coached. And I've been here for 38 years either in school or coaching and it hurt to put a gym on the football field. Cause that's where the, I told them when they started doing it, I said, fellas, I said, you better dig that up because we buried a lot of people on that football field. <laughs> we buried a lot of people on it. But times change, progress keeps going on and it, we got a good complex now. And I'll have to eat my words, I'm glad that we done it. So Diane, myself, we thank you for, for the time. Thank you, family, for the invitation. Thank you so much. Anybody have any questions uh, that we might be able to answer? Yeah, uh, Coach Tom died, didn't he? Yes, yes he did. Yes. Yes. Had a funeral on the Rush Frame football field. They named after him. We had a lot of people there. You know, he rented from my brother Don oh. at Sinclair. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, that was the best situation. Fat taught out at the, the Panhandle. Either, well, Boys City's the longest 21 years. But he would always come home and stay in Lindsay the three months he was, he was out because he always just rented the house. And uh, so after Mother died, he rented to Coach Tunnel. And that was the best setup for those two boys. Uh, <laughs> Fat always got up early and had breakfast, and then he worked around the house yeah. until noon, and then he golfed. We called oh. it his job, you know. Well, he would do that, and Coach would s s sleep in a little later, and Fat would go at 12 to, and he taught driver's ed, uh -huh. yeah. Coach Tunnelby, both my girls. And uh, so he, Fat would get up by himself to have breakfast and do his thing. Coach would get up, he'd go to work, with driver's ed, Fat was still there at noon and he would then go to the golf course and he never did get back in until about six. I mean, he was serious about golf. <laughs> and Coach had, in the meantime, got off at school at like four. He had that time to himself. And then they ate supper together and watched ball games. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I and they each so. had a bed, they each had a bedroom. I, I got one said. more story that was on my mind I want to tell you before we quit. How things have changed in, in young kids and what the kids are now. I made a talk to the football team before they played a game somewhere. And uh, two or three weeks later, one of the football players come up and said, Coach Estes, I know you played college ball and pro ball a little bit. I said, what was your combine? The combine is what you do on your, your vertical jump, your broad jump, your push-ups, your sprint, and a lot of these things. That's what they do now to see how you can do to make the team. And I said, my combine was when I was in school, my Richard Estes would get me out of bed and we would go chop cotton, haul hay, cut broom corn, haul broom corn, mm -hmm. and I'd haul 3,000 bales of hay in two days with two hay trucks. And my brother-in-law had a hay truck. We had two mead pop-up loaders. And I said, my combine was endurance with some of the other guys we had endurance build up in the heat. Mm -hmm. If you've been in the broom corn patch, you know what I'm talking about. Staying out there 10, 12 hours a day and thrashing broom corn at 12 o'clock at night, sweating, stinging, and hauling hay that you're so tired you want to go home, but you got to stay with it at just like fourth quarter when you're playing. Son, that was my combine. He said, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you never did find a bad broom corn charm. Yeah. You know, as a rule, they were too tired to get into trouble. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it, no, it was yeah, it was fun. not fun. It was we we uh, when well, it was right after our oldest daughter was born. He was roughnecking, and the rig was down, so he decided to run the Johnny crew, mm -hmm. and he had the crew, and I was the water jack. Yeah, and we went down to Bill. 
Bill Manning. Manning. Bill Manning down on Rush Creek, and it was 110 degrees that day, I know. <laughs> I had about 50 or 60 hands. <laughs> and anyway, we worked till noon, and we had stopped. We were going to uh, eat, stop and eat lunch. You know, we all took off to eat lunch. I don't know whether any of you are, are you familiar with Broomcorn and have anything? And anyway, we'd stopped to eat lunch, and uh, when we got ready to go back, I said, I'm not going back. <laughs> and he said, well, okay. But he said, you haven't got any way to get home because he said, I got to have a pickup to carry the water in, you know. He said, so I said, I don't care. I said, I'm not going back. <laughs> I, I said, you're going to have to walk because I got to keep the truck, the water truck and, out here. And I said, and I, I said, we brought her dinner. I sat there about an hour after they went back. And I thought, heck, if I'm going to have to sit here, I might as well be earning that dollar an hour. We were water water money. I think I was going $2 an hour. The pickup was dollar, dollar an hour. She was dollar an hour. $4, four dollars an hour. hour. We're going to get rich. <laughs> and I had to buy a 50 pound uh, chunk of ice. <laughs> Yeah, that room for him was not yeah. fun. Uh, Mickey Hines said one time, you know, he said, it didn't take me but about three days in the broom cornfield. I decided I wanted a different location. <laughs> well, her brother didn't like it either. Yeah, my little brother, would, when, when we were still in school, would go out and cut, and he, he never made it past noon because by noon he'd be sicker than a dog. He had drunk so much water, you yeah. know, and, of course, it was hot. He was throwing up by noon, mm -hmm. and Mother and Daddy would have to come and get him. <laughs> Sitting on the running board. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, to me, some of the best friends I've ever made was my little Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, they're like blood chemists. I've had different people ask me about different ones, like Don Howe. Uh, Are you kidding him? I said, <laughs> well, no, but it's, it's closer than blood. <laughs> it's, you know. Her, her brother, he was 10 years younger than me, but I burned him out. I mean, I, I was a workaholic. I worked and worked hard, and I broke him out young, hauling hay, and he uh, was out John, Don, John Trammell's one time hauling hay, and it was 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, and he just sat down and started crying. He said, I'm so tired. He said, I don't want to ever haul any more hay in my life. I said, okay. Unload your truck and go in the house. We'll finish it. So he did. Well, one time we had a fish fry at the house with uh, Gene Sanders family and Kent and Fox and Clara. And I, I had a, a bell spike on the back of my one ton, and he didn't know what it was. And I said, Kent, get in the truck with me. I want to go here in the back of the field here. He said, okay. He said, what are we going to do? And I said, we're going to haul hay. He started saying, I ain't hauling any more hay. <laughs> so I just lowered that spike and spiked that bell hay and laid down. He said, what are you doing? I'm a hauling hay. He said, why didn't you do that when I was at work for you? That was so funny. I pulled one over on him. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming in. Well, we enjoyed it. To tell the stories. We appreciate it. We do want to take a couple of pictures to make sure we get something from the newspaper. Okay. But your stories will be are recorded, and uh, I'm hoping that.